Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for your basic specialist training in general internal medicine induction webinar. This is the first of a series of sessions that we will be holding over Zoom from now until Christmas. You are all very welcome and we hope this session is of guidance to you as you begin this new journey. My name is Maylee Saunter, you can call me May, and I am one of the Institute of Medicine coordinators. Before we get started with each of the talks, let me give you a brief overview of who you will be listening to and what they will be covering. Firstly, you will hear from our Institute of Medicine Director of Education and Training, Professor Ed McCone, who will be giving the welcome note. Followed by Professor John McDermott, the Associate Director of BST for General Internal Medicine. Professor McDermott will be giving you an overview of the BST schemes, sites and jobs, and structure. Dr. Helen Tewitt is the Galway Scheme Regional Program Director and will be talking to you about what some of the trainer expectations are and how to manage learning as an SHO. I will then briefly cover some keynotes for your trainee journey and important contacts to help guide you on. You will also be hearing from the BST GIM representative, Dr. Claire Doyle, who will go over some important elements to remember as you start as an SHO. Lastly, you will hear from Ashlyn Smith, the Assessment and Program Development Manager, who will give you an intro to ePortfolio, where to find your curriculum requirements and goal setting. We will then hold a live Q&A for answering any questions that may arise during the talks. Please send your questions using the Q&A option rather, rather than the chat option to ensure we don't miss your questions. We hope you enjoy this session. Thank you. My name is Dr. Ed McCone, and I am the Director of Medical Education and Training at the Royal College of Physicians Institute of Medicine. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome you here on behalf of the RCPI Institute of Medicine to your basic specialist training induction today. Unfortunately, I'd much rather be there in person for us all to meet up, but under the current circumstances, it isn't possible. But I do hope we'll get a chance to meet up in person sometime in the near future. This is a very exciting time for you in your medical careers, as many of you are advancing from your internship to start your career in general internal medicine. Your basic specialist training is designed to ensure a broad exposure to all the fascinating and challenging aspects of general internal medicine. It's not without a certain amount of trepidation that I remember my first few weeks as an SHO in general medicine, but I have to say when I look back, I do think that it was the best decision I made to do general medicine, because it leads to a very rich and rewarding career. At the end of your BST training, you will have an excellent understanding of general internal medicine, and you will be ready to progress onto careers in higher specialist training should you choose to do so. As you're all aware, this is a very unprecedented time in the history of world medicine, and most of you will already have spent four months on the front line looking after patients with COVID-19. We recognize that COVID-19 has had a significant impact on all aspects of medical training, and we at the RCPI and the Institute of Medicine have been working hard with the General Medical Council and the HSE to ensure that your training over the next few years will not be adversely affected by the pandemic. Already you see today the, through the use of technology, the increased use of online web-based teaching and simulation resources, we will strive to ensure that the quality of your training will be of the highest standards possible. Over the next 90 minutes or so, you're going to be hearing in more detail about what is planned for you over the coming years of your BST. I would suggest that you first familiarize yourself with the BST curriculum to get a sense of what will be required of you over the years, and also make an effort to meet up with your assigned BST trainer as soon as possible to start planning the training and teaching goals of your medical rotations. Also, I'd like to say a few words about the ePortfolio. This is a formal record that the college keeps of your training, and it's really important that this is completed in a, clim a timely uh, manner so that in the college you, we can assess your adequate progression and also ensure that you get credit for all the work you're doing as trainees. No matter which hospital you're going to be working in across Ireland, working in general internal medicine is challenging because it's a busy and, and stressful job. Although today you are a virtual class, as you meet up in the various training hubs over the next few weeks, it's important to consider yourself the BSD class of 2020 and work together to support one another. 
working groups to pass exams, prepare cases for discussions or presentations or things like doing a small or a research project make your medical training so much more rewarding and establishes friendships that will last a lifetime. Likewise, if you're feeling stressed or noticing that one of your colleagues is struggling, make sure to reach out to your trainers or regional program directors or the health and well-being resources here in the college. And do remember that though there will be a significant service requirement in all the jobs that you will have over the next two years, you are trainees and you are in training. And if you are feeding out of your depth, do not hesitate to reach out to the more senior staff members for assistance. Likewise, as trainees, the resources of the college are available to you should you get into any difficulties. So finally, I'd just like to say that we at the IOM wish you very well and look forward to close interaction with you over the coming years and hopefully we'll get to meet up in person soon. Best of luck and take very good care of yourselves. Thank you. Hello everyone, John McDermott is my name. I'm a consultant endocrinologist in Connolly Hospital, Blanchardstown, and I'm also the Associate Director of the Basic Specialist Training Programme here in the College. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all onto the BST scheme. My hope is that in two years time, you'll all exit the scheme with a BST cert in hand and will progress on to higher specialist training here with us in the College in your chosen specialty. In order to be awarded a BST cert, you have to have completed your two years with us, have passed all of your assessments, passed the membership exams and kept your logbook up to date. But as well as accomplishing all that, we hope that you really enjoy your two years with us and meet great new friends and colleagues along the way. Now, as you know, the training is organised along the hub and spoke model. So you've all been assigned a central training hub and in each hub, there's a regional program director. That's a consultant who's responsible for organising the training in the hub and out to the spokes. You're also all assigned to a spoke hospital for a minimum of six months. And each spoke hospital has a local training lead. Again, a consultant responsible for ensuring good quality training occurs in the spoke sites. But the most important person in terms of your training is your trainer. And that's the consultant that you're going to work with for the three months of your rotations. So having a BST trainee on your team is a privilege. And in exchange for that privilege, the trainers, as well, of course, as expecting you to provide a service and patient care is the priority, have undertaken that there should be a strong training component to their posts. And that includes having regular journal clubs, grand rounds and SHO teaching and facilitating you in attending a minimum of eight outpatient clinics, participating in on-call and presenting your admitted patients to the consultant. It's hugely important that you meet with your consultant trainer at the beginning of your rotation to outline your goals for the rotation and to learn what the trainer's expectations of you are. And it's also important that you meet at the end of the rotation to run through what you have accomplished and potentially to get advice about future goals for your next rotations. If your training isn't progressing as planned or as you would like, if you have any problems as you go along, talk to your trainer first, approach your local training lead. If problems aren't being resolved, talk to the regional program director. And I am always here to help if needed. You can contact me through the team here in the college or at my personal email, which we'll provide later. The transition from working as an intern to working as an SHO can be very difficult. Uh, personally, I found it the, the hardest transition of all. But remember, if you're struggling with it, there are, there's lots of support available. Your second year SHO colleagues are often a hugely valuable resource. They've been through the first year already. Your registrar colleagues and as mentioned, your trainer, your training lead, your regional program director, me and the team in the college, we're always here to help if needed. So finally, just to welcome you all once again, I really hope you enjoy your two years and look forward to working with some of you as your trainer over the next couple of years. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Helen Sheet. I am one of the regional programme directors and I'm based in Galway. I've been asked by the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland to give a short 10 minute presentation to you uh, on the BST scheme from a trainer and regional programme director perspective. And really that relates to what we may expect from you over the two years. I apologise that this has been done as a pre-recording because ideally this should be done as an interactive question and answer session where we can discuss issues and if there's feedback uh, that would be uh, much better. However, because of COVID we're doing these as pre-recordings and I will do my best to impart as much as we can um, over these 10 minutes. So at the end of your basic specialist training, your goal is to progress on um, to become a medical registrar. Ideally, um, a specialist registrar and a number of SHOs do go directly into specialty training, but certainly by the end of it, you should be uh, functioning as a medical registrar. And if you've chosen general medicine as your career path, you need to formulate an expert knowledge of a wide range of common acute disorders um, over your BST training time. And how do you do that? Well, as a first year SHO, there is an expectation that you have the ability to take a detailed history, do a uh, competent clinical examination, formulate a differential and put together a management plan. And this, in my opinion, aligns very well with your membership preparation because completion of your two-year BST scheme along with the qualification of MRCPI shows that you have or are well on the way to an advanced knowledge in general medicine. And at the end of it, we would say that you can effectively take history, do an exam, formulate investigations uh, and management plans. Your aims are to complete your memberships, to ensure that your e-portfolio is completed and fully signed off, and I'll speak to that a little bit later in the talk. If possible, uh, we would highly encourage that you participate in research, but certainly you should be performing an audit each year of your scheme, and they are readily available with any of your, uh, during any of your uh, rotations. You should also begin to explore uh, potential career paths and hopefully by the end of your two years you'll be focused on a particular career path going forward. The BST um, trainers are very important uh, to your scheme and you'll have a new trainer each three months um, and it's part of your job to make the, the most of this by looking for feedback and trying to engage with your trainer. But I would remind you that any and all conversations with your trainer should be uh, uh, regarded as feedback. It doesn't always have to come in a very formal face-to-face -face environment. Post-take ward rounds would be very important uh, getting feedback from your particular trainers. So I would just uh, remind you that uh, of that important piece of information. It is also important and I would urge you to make the most of your in-hospital training and learning opportunities that are available. Of course each department will have their own teaching schedule but within the hospitals itself where you're based there should be hospital-wide education sessions for you to attend. They would include grand rounds. Here in Galway we would have medical case conference sessions and Often, the bigger centres will have dedicated membership training opportunities and teaching sessions. I would encourage you, if you're in smaller centres that may not have uh, a fully uh, established MRCPI training or education sessions, that you take some of that on yourselves. And anecdotally, I know um, that there are uh, small groups of SHOs, if they're all preparing for the memberships, they take it upon themselves to form study groups. And I would encourage you to do that um, if, if you find yourself in that situation. You may face challenges in your uh, BST and the most notable of which is likely to be your examinations. 
I would encourage you to book your leave, um, and particularly study leave, well in advance uh, to help in the preparation for these exams. Because we know that working a full-time job and preparing for the MRCPI can be quite a challenge for everybody. And I would ask that you proactively send emails to your consultants or to whoever is organising the ROTA to ensure that you get the study leave that you require in helping you prepare for that exam. Individual centres, of course, have individual um, rotas, um, and I can't speak to everywhere, but from a personal pers um, perspective, I would be expecting emails from SHOs that are pre preparing for memberships uh, to help um, uh, cordon off some study leave for them. The other opportunity to tell us about challenges that you faced in your BST scheme is at the end of your assessments. And I think it's important that you realise that that's your opportunity to give feedback to us. Uh, in my experience, these are the times where I hear about things that we may not always be aware of because we cannot change anything to do with the schemes unless we know about it. And what those end of your assessments are, you meet with two of your trainers uh, or your RPD, and it's an individual meeting where it's just yourself in the room uh, with two trainers or possibly your RPD, um, where everything around your e-portfolio, your training over the year, um, is gone through. And it gives you that opportunity to tell us if there's been any challenges that you faced over that year. What is a regional programme director? Well, a regional programme director is the person that helps to coordinate the training in, of BST within that particular centre. And for me, that's the Galway area. Um, but what does it mean, I suppose, for you? Uh, particularly, uh, possibly not a huge amount. Um, if you progress through your scheme with no issues, you may, we may never need to, just to, 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 to be in contact. However, the, if you need any special leave, um, the regional programme director is the person that signs that off. And that would be uh, relating to special leave due to illness, and maybe due to maternity leave, uh, or other uh, types of leave. And we also oversee learning opportunities within our area and also ensure that the curriculum is up to date. The regional programme directors for each centre are outlined here and I would encourage you just to note who your particular regional programme director is um, and if you needed to make contact with them you need to um, link in with the RCPI BST office and they could help you uh, drop an email to one of these RPD um, directors. So for Beaumont and Connolly, it's Dr. Alan Moore and Professor Jim O'Neill. For Galway, it's myself. For the Manor, it's Dr. Denise Sadler. For Mayo, it's Dr. Saeed Rizvi. For Sligo, it's Professor Catherine McHugh. For the Midwest, it's Dr. John McManus. For St. James's, it's Dr. Declan Byrne. And for Tala, it's Dr. Lucianne Behan. For St. Vincent's, it's Dr. John Garvey. For the South, it's Dr. Norma Harmondy and Dr. Pat Barry. And for South East, it's Dr. Elizabeth Abernathy. So the most common questions um, that I get asked as a PT here in Galway is who is my trainer? As you know, having completed internship, is that our consultants uh, consultants now work in larger teams than before. So it is very possible that you may not work directly with your trainer over the three month period that you're on that rotation. That still means though that that is your trainer. and. Although you're not directly in contact with them on the wards, him or her, um, it is important that you find um, where they're based and introduce yourselves to them and begin the process of your e-portfolio um, uh, sign-off. Uh, the best place to start, in my experience, is through the secretaries. They can guide you as to when um, it may be a, a, a good time to link with your trainer. So. It really, I would emphasize that the onus is on you to try and seek out your trainer. They have all signed up to do this training for GIM and they will be expecting you to touch base with them. The second question most commonly um, that is asked, certainly here in Galway, is can I switch rotations? To be clear, we don't actively encourage uh, switching rotations. We've, they are um, set up, each scheme is set up for a particular reason in that way. 
However, we are also realistic that there, as you go through your scheme, sometimes you realise, I really want to do a rotation and so in such a thing, because that's where you think your interest lies. If you can find another trainee that's willing to swap, um, and if your core rotations and requirements are not affected, it may be possible to do that switch. But that must be signed off by the regional program director and they will have the final say on whether that rotational change can actually happen. Coming towards the end of the talk, I would encourage you to be proactive in your training on BST. And that begins with checking your ePortfolio at the beginning of your post, ensuring all the de details are correct, and again, emphasizing to find out um, when you can meet your trainer. You should engage in all teaching sessions that are available, and you need to record your training as you go along. Doing this avoids a lot of heartache towards the end of the rotation, or certainly towards the end of your final year, or, in, or till the end of your first year or your second year, when you're looking to go back and look for this retrospectively. It is a very difficult thing to do, and I would urge you at the end of each three months to get things sorted and signed off. And again, re-emphasizing the importance of setting up meetings with your secretaries and looking, or with your trainers and looking to use their secretaries uh, as a way of helping you uh, uh, set them up. I'm just going to finish then by thanking you all for your attention uh, and for listening today. And I would take the opportunity also to wish you the very best of luck over the next two years. And I hope you enjoy progressing through the, the next two years of your training. And if you're in Galway, um, no doubt I'll be seeing you um, very soon. Thanks. Hello again, everyone. For those of you joining now, my name is Meili Santos. You can call me May. I am one of the Institute of Medicine coordinators, and I will be walking you through some of the important things you will need to know as you begin your training journey. So you have all met Professor John McDermott a little earlier. Professor John McDermott is the Associate Director of BST, and Professor McDermott looks after the management and direction of BST and he can be contacted at bst at rcpi.ie. As Dr. Helen Tewitt mentioned earlier, there is a regional program director for each of the BST schemes. The regional program directors oversee the schemes in each of the hospitals. For the Bowman Connolly scheme, your RPDs are Professor Alan Moore and Professor Jim O'Neill. In Galway, Dr. Helen Tewitt, who you heard from earlier this afternoon. In the matter, we have Dr. Denise Sadlier. In Mayo Sligo, we have Dr. Saeed Rizvi and Prof. Kathy McHugh. In the Midwest, we have Dr. John McManus. In St. James's Tala, we have Professor Declan Byrne and Dr. Lucianne Behan. In St. Vincent's, your RPD is Dr. John Garvey. In the South, Dr. Norma Harnady and Dr. Pat Berry, and in the Southeast, Dr. Elizabeth Abernathy. In the Institute of Medicine, we currently have four dedicated coordinators available to assist and guide you through your training. Any queries or issues you may have, for example, with your portfolio, you can email any, of, any one of us or simply email bst at rcpi .ie, and one of us will be able to assist. Also on the team, we have Jane Fletcher as the team lead and Louis Lavelle, the IOM manager. Currently, we also have four coordinators available to help in our four regional sites across Ireland. We have Fiona Collins in Cork as part of the South Southwest Hospital Group, Sheila Kelly in Galway as part of the Salta Hospital Group, Moira Graham in Limerick as part of the UL Hospital Group, and Shelley Coleman in James's Tala as part of the Dublin Midlands Hospital Group. Like us in the RCPI offices, they are also readily available to help you along your training journey with any queries or issues you may have. 
other contacts that you should be aware of as you might need them along the way. For queries related to your BST mandatory courses, which we will go over in a little bit, please email the courses department at courses at rcpi.ie. Queries related to exams should go to examinations at rcpi.ie. Training queries that might arise, such as curriculum doubts, ePortfolio issues, or any other training related issues, should be sent to one of the IOM coordinators or to BST at rcpi.ie. All other queries can be forwarded to the help desk at helpdesk at rcpi.ie. So what does your BST GIM entail? What are the things that you as a trainee need to be mindful of and understand? Your curriculum, your learning opportunities, ePortfolio, Brightspace, examinations, and evaluations. These are the elements that make up your basic specialist training, and we will discuss a little of each. But before we discuss each of the elements, what are the things you should be doing for each of your eight rotations? At the top, at the top of your priority list, you should be reviewing your curriculum, meeting your trainer to set goals, and planning to take your exams. April 21, your third rotation, you should start thinking about the upcoming BST evaluations. How do I prepare? Have I kept my ePortfolio up to date? During your October 21, January 22 rotation, your sixth rotation, you should be mindful of HST applications. Will you apply? Have you kept your training records up to date? And your last rotation, April 22, July 22. Have I met all of my training goals? Am I prepared for my final evaluation? One of the most important elements of your training is your curriculum. So where can you find your curriculum? You can access it at any time through our website and also through your ePortfolio, which I will show you in a slide to come. We'd encourage you to download your curriculum so you have it handy when needed. It is very important you become familiar with your curriculum so that you understand what is expected of you and so that you get the most out of your training. There are two courses that are mandatory components of BST GIM. Leadership in Clinical Practice, which is a four-part module, and Ethics Prescribing Skills and Blood Transfusion, which is a two-part module. Dates for these will be pre-assigned and we will communicate these dates with you all in the coming weeks. However, currently with COVID-19, these workshops are currently being held over Zoom. In addition to the two mandatory courses, it is also required that you have infection control, which is delivered at your hospital induction, and your ACLS needs to be up to date at all times. Oh, just to state, if you complete your courses after you finish your BST, you will have to pay a fee. So um, it's important to get them done during your two years. MRCPI exams. Plan when you will attempt to take the exams if you haven't already. We recommend attempting part one during your first year of BST. Thing to note, after starting BSD, you have four years to pass all parts of the MRCPI exams, and you have a maximum of six attempts each component. Part one takes three hours and is 100 single best answer questions, all computer-based. Part two takes two and a half hours and is composed of two papers and 75 best answer questions. The clinical is broken into two parts. The first part has two 25-minute long cases, and the second part has five 10-minute short cases. One of the short cases is the communication and ethics interaction with a role player. With COVID-19, a new exams calendar has been published on our website, and I'd encourage you to check regularly for any updates to exams by going onto our website. 
During your two years, you will have two evaluations, one before the end of your first year and the other before the end of your second year. During the evaluation, you will need to show that you have been keeping up with your curriculum requirements and updating ePortfolio accordingly. You will get one of the four outcomes. Outcome one will mean that you are deemed suitable to progress. Outcome two will mean that you have insufficient records of training kept in ePortfolio and you will have three weeks to complete these. Outcome three means that you do not have enough time on the training scheme and insufficient records in ePortfolio. And outcome four means you have not um, progressed sufficiently and you will be referred for a meeting with the Associate Director of BST. So where do you access your ePortfolio and your courses? Access RCPI Digital Services by logging into the RCPI website. If you need your email or password reset, email helpdesk at rcpi.ie. Once you log in, you will be directed to your digital hub. These digital services help you manage your training and educational activities. Click on the ePortfolio link and you will be brought to the Kaizen ePortfolio system. Here you can see what your trainee dashboard looks like. Click on the plus to create a form or on the green create button. Here on your dashboard, you will also be able to see your curriculum, which is available to download. We will be emailing you in the coming days to let you know when your ePortfolio becomes available for access. When we do, I'd encourage each of you to log in and become familiar with it and, and send us any queries you might have. Here on your dashboard, you are able to view all of your training information, including your rotations, your specialties, and your trainers for all eight rotations. And, and if any of the information displayed here is incorrect, please let one of the RCPI coordinators know, um, and we can correct that information for you. By clicking on the plus or the create button, you will be brought to this page with a list of all of the available forms. I'd advise you to take some time now at the start of your training before anything else gets too busy to become familiar with ePortfolio. Reach out to the coordinators if you don't understand certain elements. Click into all of the forms and see what amount of work is involved in each. It's important to note that forms need to be completed during each rotation. You will not be able to, to fill these in retrospectively, so be mindful of dates. Don't let deadlines creep up on you. Record as you go along. So a quick recap. We will be communicating in the coming days when your ePortfolio does become available. If you need to reset emails, passwords for RCPI, please contact the help desk at rcpi.ie. When your ePortfolio does become available, log in and check that your posts, specialties, and trainer details are correct, and communicate with your IOM coordinator if anything is missing or incorrect. Read and become familiar with your curriculum. Know what is expected of you. Arrange a meeting with your trainer to agree on your goals for your post and your training. Record your activities on a regular basis. Remember to complete your quarterly end of post forms. And remember to submit all records before finishing in a post as you are not able to record forms retrospectively. Courses. Where can I access my courses? On your digital hub, when you log into our CPI, you will find under the portfolio link, the RCPI Brightspace link. Brightspace is our RCPI courses portal. Here is where you will find all of your BST mandatory courses as they become available to you. It is a new RCPI virtual learning environment where content for courses, both 
online and offline, and study days is available and where you will find your certificates of attendance. If you have any course related queries, please email the courses department at courses at rcpi.ie. Also available in your digital hub, access to online journals, research services, and your RCPI affinity scheme, where you will find some of the benefits available to trainees, such as discounts on shopping, hotels, dining, parking, and more. Other benefits available to trainees are the student leap cards and a four-month BMJ on examination access pass. Quick reminder about the leap cards, you should have received an email about applying for them. Remember to apply by the 12th of, of August. So remember, to get started on the right track with your training, know your curriculum in and out. Don't be afraid to reach out if you do not understand. Meet your trainer. Get to know your RCPI digital services. Start using ePortfolio. And again, we will be emailing you all in the coming days to let you know that access is now available. Research your mandatory courses, look at the online opportunities available to you, and start thinking about your exams. Also important to remember, your training information cannot be submitted retrospectively. So it's important to complete these forms during each of your rotation. Do not leave this to the last minute. Know which forms require trainer sign off and ensure your trainer does sign these off. Most importantly, remember we are here for you on your BST journey. Do not hesitate to ask for help. We are here to help you. You have a support network, so don't hesitate in reaching out. Your trainer is there, your BST training lead, your site trainee representative, trainees committee representative, medical manpower and occupational health, RCPI IOM coordinators, RCPI health and well-being department, training post evaluation, regional program director and associate director of BST. We are all here to help you. Best of luck with your BST and thank you. Hi everyone, I hope you've been enjoying our talks and um, Dr. Claire Doyle was supposed to go next. However, she um, is unfortunately not going to be able to join us. So I'm, and she sends her apologies. So I'm going to go on to the next person who is Ashton Smith. Hi, my name is Ashling Smith. I'm an Education Specialist in RCPI. I'm the Assessment and Programme Development Manager. So I work with your trainers and the Regional Programme Directors to develop the content of your programme and also the assessments that go into it. So what I'm going to do today is just take you through the curriculum and give you the key highlights of that, of what requirements there are for your programme and just a very brief description of some of the assessments. So we will do a more in-depth webinar on this, where we're going to spend 30 minutes going into the specifics of the requirements and how you log them in your portfolio. What I'm covering today should just be enough to get you started reading through the document and planning where you're going to go in your first three month rotation. And once you've had a little bit of time to figure things out, um, then we'll be more specific about what the, the requirements are. But it is all there in the document for anyone who's anxious to read through all the requirements straight away. And we definitely do recommend that you do that. We're also going to do a follow up webinar um, specific to the membership exam. I know some of you may have already taken some or all parts of that. So that'll also just be a 30 minute webinar and we'll make it available for people to, to watch if you can't uh, join live. But keep an eye out for the dates for those. OK, they'll be happening through August. 
So the curriculum document's available on the website and it's also available in your ePortfolio when you log in. So May's probably already uh, said that. Um, so when we go to, so what it can, includes is an introduction, which is just your structure of your post requirements, um, any kind of major requirements for the programme, policies on time out and things like that. But most of them are found in the training regulations document that you'll already have been directed to. The in introduction of the curriculum just gives a brief overview of them as well, but it's the same information. The second section is core professional skills. So what this is, is a section that outlines the professional um, expectations of you from your trainers and from the college as a whole. It's guided by the Medical Council standards and it includes things like communication, teamwork, um, general guidelines on prescribing infection control and well-being. Um, so really here is a framework of the professional standards that you're going to be judged against. So if you're getting feedback in your assessment on professionalism, it'll be structured around these outcomes. And likewise, if you want to give examples of good professional behaviour, that's a good place to look at. And it's a good starting point as well for your exams. If you're thinking about trying to, to work through some scenarios for ethics or professional that, professionalism that might come up um, in your clinical communication stations or even in your part two written, um, it will give you some idea of the type of topics that are covered in those. The specialty section is what I'm mainly going to focus on today. So this outlines the outcomes of what's expected of you at the end of BST training. Some of these are going to be very straightforward things that you're going to achieve in your first few months. Some of them are going to be take a little more time. Most of them are assessed at different points throughout the programme and the focus is on the expected standard for the level of experience that you have at that point in time. That's nearly always what you're being assessed against, okay? So it's really important to have communications with your trainer about what's expected of you because that's the best way for you to know what, uh, what standard that you're actually being assessed against at that point. You'll see throughout the specialty section that there are some specific feedback points in most places, that's because the specific knowledge that you need that your trainer may ask you about, or there's something specific that you're going to be assessed at during your membership exam. So a lot of the places in your curriculum, you'll see it says assessed at the membership exam. And if that's the case, it will also detail the standard that's expected there. And really what that is, is that you should be able to talk about those things. I'll come to them in a little bit. Okay. So what's a training goal? So I'll be talking about training goals. Obviously, this, you also have your personal goals and you're going to be doing your personal goal plan. But when we're referring to training goals, we're referring to groups of outcomes. All right. So, for example, we have, you know, physical examination being a group of outcomes and then there's specific outcomes underneath that. So that's what's going to be used for your end of post assessments and for your end of year assessment. They're going to be done based on your training goals. Your outcomes are what your workplace-based assessments are going to be, and they really feed into your end of post assessment. So during your rotation, for example, if you're doing a geriatric rotation, you may do um, you may want to clear off one uh, outcome on history, which would be very specific, and that's take and present a collateral history for an older person. So what you're logging in your ePortfolio is where you've done that. They might be something like perform a physical exam, um, so a respiratory exam or prescribe safely. So they've got something um, very specific at the start that they need to do and they really should be clear as to what the standard that's expected there is. Is this something you should be able to discuss? Is it something you should actually be able to do or is it something you should just be aware of? So that's how you should read those when you go through. And they're broken down um, in, the, in the full document. But there's also a summary table uh, for you in there. So your overall training goals for BST are uh, history taking, physical examination, differential diagnosis and next steps, acute medicine and safe prescribing. I think they're all pretty obvious ones of what's going to be grouped under there. And really, as you progress through your career in medicine, it's just going to be different levels um, of expectation around those things that you're looking for. You also have the core professional skills. So you'll see some things like handover and well-being where you're expected to actually log some information on that. Um, and that's really just that you've engaged in those processes and made yourself aware. And then your concurrent training activities is things like your grand rounds, your journal clubs, any of those things that we expect you to take advantage of while you're on BST to enhance your own learning. So a page from the curriculum, this is just one example. I know there's a lot of, a lot of text here, but it's literally a screenshot from the actual document to show just to show you how it's structured. So I've taken history taking. So you'll see at the top, top there 
there is six um, expectations of you by the end of BST. So you should be able to demonstrate actual examples of when you've taken a focus on accurate history, social history, occupational history, allergy history, medication history, and a collateral history. So trying to get at least one of these signed off in each exam, each rotation is really important. But also when you come to doing your membership exam, these are the type of things, again, that are going to come up in that station. And people do fail on these. Often when people read them, you know, they think this is really obvious. I'm doing this all the time. But sometimes people aren't doing them to the standard that they, they should be, or that they think they, they are. So just putting yourself in a situation where you're getting feedback on them is important so that the first time you're getting actual structured feedback isn't when you're in an exam scenario. And I don't want to focus too much on the exam because the purpose of these requirements is so that you'll be able to do the job that's expected of you when you start day one as a registrar. That's really what we're aiming for here. But it is also tied into your membership, which is a key uh, part of the assessment for that. So you see underneath the outcomes. So each set of outcomes is going to be in that box at the top of your, your page. And then underneath, it's going to tell you what kind of assessment there is in the workplace. So for this, you can ask a senior team member um, or anyone to just discuss with you what the outcomes are in your portfolio. They don't need to be set up. They're able to just mark off, yes, this person was uh, able to do this. Yes, they were able to do that. And then that will go to your trainer. So when you come to the end of post-assessment, your trainer will see that you've logged a number of these conversations with different people. They'll see who you were logging them with and they'll tell you if it was appropriate or not. Obviously, in a lot of cases, it's going to be your trainer you're having those conversations with, and that's great. But it's also good to get feedback from a variety of people that's going to help you really develop your skills. Underneath, you'll see if there's a structured assessment. So that'll detail if it's, you know, so this obviously appears in the MRCPI exam. It's also something you do at your end of post and at your end of your evaluation. But if there's an actual directly observed assessment or anything like that that needs to be signed off, that will be in there too. And then the box to the right hand side is an example of the focus of feedback. So you'll see these boxes through the curriculum. So there it's telling you what standards you're being uh, gauged against when you're doing your um, workplace feedback. And what's in there specifically as well is the standards that the examiners will be looking for in the membership exam. So for example, your actual communication skills, are you fluent? Are you establishing correct facts? Are you actively listening? So it's worth you know, if you're in a situation where you're preparing for that or you're just trying to improve your skills, it's worth actually asking someone, you know, did I do this well? How was I on this? Did you think it came across that I was listening to the patient? Because sometimes as well, we're not necessarily aware that what we're what we're doing isn't coming across to a patient. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what's really important as well, that they feel listened to and they feel confident that you've understood the correct information from them. So it's always worth getting feedback. So you'll see those for each of the different sets of training goals throughout the curriculum. There's pages like that. OK, so um, there is also this summary table. So you see in the summary table, there's a column for the frequency with which you're expected to do something, uh, a column for what you're expected to record in your portfolio um, and a column for when it's actually complete. So there you have, um, for example, taking a, so a social history. So you're supposed to do that at some point during the training program. So you see frequency says training program. You're supposed to record the actual feedback that you get. So on the form, you're supposed to record the conversation that you've had. And then at the end of post assessment, if your trainer is happy that you're at a level that you should be and you don't need further feedback, um, further structured feedback on that outcome, then they'll mark it as complete. Something else like take and present a focused and accurate history, that's going to get marked at each post. So it'll, it won't show up as complete until the end of your program because you're going to get marked in it eight different times where someone says, is this person progressing? And your trainer will say yes or yes or comment. Or if they say no, then they'll be expected to put in place some supports for you to actually develop that further. You'll also see the, the name of the portfolio form that's there and then the page that the details about that outcome are on. OK, so I'm not going to spend too much time going through these, but this is the, the, the full list of the outcomes is there. So you've got the differential diagnosis and the acute medicine and the safe prescribing. So on the follow up webinar, I'll go through each of those. OK, but I'm just going to call out one requirement for the moment, and that's under um, diagnosis outcome eight. So this is one um, that just is a little maybe less clear than, than some of the others. So this is your specialty case experience. So at each post you do, you're expected to sit down with your trainer and talk about cases that you will have seen 
while you're in that post. We don't specify, except for cardiology, what those cases should be. So this outcome saying that you should be able to demonstrate an ability to, to do all these things is assuming that you've had the, the necessary experience and exposure. So you'll see a list of 10 specialties there. So you should be logging this against, uh, so in, in five of your rotations at a minimum, it should be the things of these, the, the 10 off this list, okay? So you should be logging cases at every rotation, but obviously some of you will do rotations that aren't on this list. Um, and that's absolutely fine. What your requirement is, is that you have cases from at least five of these. One of them must be cardiology. OK, so you don't have to do a cardiology rotation, but you should. There's specific case lists given and you should make sure you've at least had some exposure to each of those cases. And if you think that's going to be difficult for you, then talk to your trainer and see are you going to be able to get opportunities at that particular post you're in. And some posts will be better than others for doing those. Of the first five there, you should do at least three of them overall, okay? So if you do the cardiology requirements, that's fine. Then you might also choose to log five medicine for the elderly cases and five gastro cases, then one infectious disease, one rheumatology, and then your other cases that you log at other posts can be on whatever is appropriate to that post. It shouldn't be a problem for people to actually gain that experience, but it is just worth having a conversation with your trainer of what their expectations are, of what cases you should log. And that should be one of the first things you're thinking about in this post. When you sit down to do your goals meeting, what cases would this trainer like you to be proficient in by the time you finish? Some trainers are going to have a really broad expectation. Other trainers are going to say two or three cases specifically. A lot of it will depend on what the workload is for the job that you're in. But that's the best way to ensure that you're meeting your trainer's expectations. Because at the end of the day, they're the person marking at your end of post assessment if you've progressed based on what their expectations are of you in post, right? So when you're doing your goals meeting, um, it's really important, firstly, to make sure that that meeting happens, but secondly, to make sure that you're going in with some idea of what you'd like to achieve as well. Because if you know that this is your gastro rotation and it's going to be the only time you do gastro, but you've already got your head set on uh, doing gastro at HST level, then you need to spend a little bit of time talking about the experience you're going to get while you're in that post. So when you're setting your goals, so it's up to you to set that goal meeting with your trainer. I'm sure everyone's seen the SMART goals acronym before. So just make sure they are things that are, are realistic. You're going to get very busy. There's a lot going on. It's a big change, even though a lot of, obviously you guys have already been working in quite a different scenario for the last few months. But there's a lot going on. Um, and you've got to think about your, your training program on top of that as well. So make sure that you're being realistic about what you're going to achieve. Um, that you're setting actual timelines for it. Um, and they can just be things like doing your actual part one exam um, or, or they might be getting opportunities to attend a specific clinic. Talk to the trainer and see what opportunities are going to be available to you. So know what your program requirements are. Do you go through the curriculum document, actually read it and set out you know, what you think you can achieve in specific times. Plan for your examinations. When you have your... Uh, well, maybe not your goals meeting, but if you have the opportunity to talk to someone who's done the job that you're in before or other people on the team, try to get a sense of how busy or how quiet certain jobs are, especially if they're another rotation that you're moving into, because it, there might be times that are better than others to plan your study for your membership exams. Your membership exams are based mainly on cases. So your case experience and your actual exposure in the hospital is the single biggest predictor of how well you do in the exams. But if you're able to get opportunities to read a bit more widely, you know, some jobs are just going to be better for that than others. So don't put yourself under undue pressure to do the exam while you're in a job that's notably much busier or much harder than something else. Um, especially if it's just maybe something that's not even to your, to your own strengths rather than it just being about being busy. Take advantage of the learning opportunities that are there. Um, I'm sure Claire is going to uh, talk about those a little bit as well, but you've, um, or has, You've got, you know, courses, um, grand rounds, MDT meetings, guest speakers who come in. There's always loads of things on the RCPI website. So you can just make sure that, you you know, you put those things into your calendar. If you see something that's going to be of interest to you, um, do try and come to it or try and get the recording. A lot of the stuff is available online and there is specific BST content there. So there are specific expert interviews that you aren't required to watch but you should. And in a lot of the sites that you're going to be in, trainers will put on tutorials. If they put them on, 
do go because if people don't attend them then the trainers just don't keep putting them on and it impacts the next people um and i so i know you know it's not always easy to find the time for those things but it can make you feel a little more in control of what's going on when you're coming up to your exams and also just in terms of your general knowledge about cases if you try and come to the acute take course so Again, one of the other follow-ups we're going to have from this, on a normal induction day, we'd actually be doing a, a short session, about an hour and a half, two hours, on acute cases with SPRs. We don't have the opportunity to do that today, but we are going to do it in the near future um, in a virtual session. So do sign up for that and keep an eye out for those things on the website. Think about what your trainer expects from you. They expect you to be professional and to be managing your own learning. You have to drive things. Some trainers will chase you up for things like your end of post assessment and your goals form and making sure things in order, but a lot of them won't. It is up to you. And at the end of the day, if your trainer doesn't do it, you're the person who's going to be disadvantaged. If you're having a problem and you feel like your trainer isn't communicating with you when you put in the effort to contact them, let us know. Let your coordinator know early on and then we'll be able to, to help you um, talk to your regional program director. But there's no point in sitting there, not trying to contact them, waiting for them to, to come to you. Try and flag problems when they're happening and do get in touch with your coordinator. We will do our best to make sure that someone helps you. Try to initiate meetings in your post. So in every post, you should be uh, trying to initiate three meetings. So your goals meeting, um, try to do that early on and have some idea of what you want to get out of it. Try to do one of your observed assessments. So say to your trainer, I'd really like to do my prescribing assessment in this post. So you have to do four of those across the two years. So if you've got a trainer who you, who you think you'd like, or if you're in a um, rotation where you feel very confident around your prescribing skills for that rotation, ask your trainer to do that. Or one of the other observed assessments, especially with the physical examination, you know, try and get those signed off early so that you're getting the feedback early and you're well practiced by the time you come to your clinical exam. And then obviously your end of post. So make sure you initiate that in time, get it set up and have everything in order when you come to that meeting. Seek opportunities to learn where you can. The trainers will provide them for you if they think that you're going to, to take them. And it's a two way street there. So I know that's a bit of a, a whirlwind of, of information there. As I said, we're going to do a more detailed um, follow up. And if you have any questions in the Q&A, send them on. Or um, also, obviously, you know, you can email your coordinator at any time. Um, but just my main piece of advice at this point would be read through your curriculum. Make sure you understand what you're trying to achieve. Try to do some planning towards your outcomes. Um, and do come to the, the, the second webinar with questions if you have them. Always happy. And if it's feedback on either portfolio structure or the curriculum document itself on where we can make clarifications, let us know and we will try to, to make those. OK, thanks. Bye. Okay, so thank you for watching everyone. That's the end of our videos and our talks. Um, so now we will begin the live Q&A session. Um, if you could please all send your questions in the Q&A um, area instead of the chat, that would be very great. Um, so let me introduce the panel here today. Um, we have Jane Fletcher and Ashlyn Smith and Professor John McDermott and myself, Maylee Santos. Okay, so let me open up the Q&A area here. So the first question we have there is, will this be available as a video afterwards? And yes, um, we will be making this available um, to everyone afterwards. The second question we have is, any ideas about how part three of the MRCPI will take place? So I'll answer that, mate. So where we're at with the clinical exams now is we don't quite know what's going to happen this year. Um, there is a commitment within the college. We do want to be able to run a clinical exam before the end of the year so that people can see out their membership if they're, if they're that far along. Um, there is a, a, a clinical lead has been appointed. There is a meeting taking place next week to see what we can do around that. A lot of it's going to depend on what the guidance is within the hospitals because the exams do take place in hospitals without patients. Um, they're not actors. 
So obviously we need to be very careful that we're, we're adhering to, to everything appropriately there. If there are changes to the exam, they'll be communicated in advance of that, um, at, you know, so, so that you've got some time to prepare, but it will be marked on the same topics and same standards and same kind of cases um, if we do need to, to make a change. So you shouldn't have to prepare in a different way. So short answer is we don't know yet, but we will be trying our best um, if everything continues on the way it is towards things reopening and such that we will be running something within 2020. Yep, next question is, how do I know who my trainer is? So does that, does it, do I answer that again? <laughs> or do you want to do that, Jane? Hi, guys, Valeria. So your trainer generally is the lead consultant that um, you're working with at the moment. We will be uploading your rotations to ePortfolio shortly. So you should see those hopefully by the middle of next week or so, but we'll email you and let you know. So your trainer, when you log into ePortfolio, you'll see your profile and that will have your post with your specialty and your trainer listed on there. Um, if as well, then if you're in any doubt at all, you can contact Medical Manpower who will be able to advise you as well. Yeah, next question we have is, is the portfolio the same as logbook? Yes, they're both the same. Okay, and next question is, can you get anything signed off after the rotation? Some people said they could, but the presenter said it wasn't possible. So if you, if you don't complete something while you're in post with the person who's your assigned trainer, people will have to go back and extend the dates in your portfolio for someone to do it. So it's a lot of hassle and back and forth. So but if something happens and for some reason, say someone was off sick or you were off sick or, you know, anything like that, it can be facilitated, but it's just going to administratively cause you a lot of headaches. And so it's, it's an awful lot easier if you can get everything done in post. But if for some reason you don't, don't panic. And next question, are we eligible for MRCP question bank free subscription? How and when can we obtain that if yes? Yes, so there is a four month um, pass for the BMJ on examination. Um, so if you send us an email at bst at rcpi.ie, we can get you that sorted, okay? Just a tip, I guess, on that as well is that that's best used for testing yourself to see if you're ready to take the exam. So don't you start your four months at a point where you're just starting your study. You're best off kind of starting some of your reading up on cases, organizing your notes, and then then getting the BMJ because otherwise, you know, you, you might run out of time on that if, even if you had the best intentions. Yep, next question is, in regards to clinical trainer, are we all pre-assigned a trainer? And I assume the trainer is revealed on the portfolio. I can answer that one. So yeah, so like we said, so for each three month rotation you have, you have a predetermined trainer for that specific post. Um, and so the details will be posted to ePortfolio once you have access. Um, but if you have any concerns of, or you're not sure who your trainer is, you can contact either us here in the college or you can contact Medical Manpower um, and they'll be able to advise you as well. Mm -hmm. Next question is, I have previously had an ePortfolio on Kaizen as a standalone SHO on the general register. Will my current Kaizen app account be updated to include all of the GIM relevant contact content automatically? Yeah, so, so if you're using the same RCPI registration number, then when the email goes out from, from May to say, that your portfolio is live, it should just appear there. And when you go in, you just choose uh, on the drop down that you're, you're doing your BST portfolio. Next question, will be allocated more than one trainer since we are working in different rotations? I can answer that. So yes, you will have more than one trainer um, as you rotate from one specialty to the next, um, your trainer will change. Regarding your trainer, if you are working with a team in which the consultant rotates 
example, on a monthly basis, can any of the lead consultants sign off on your rotation? So I guess you would have one predetermined trainer, but yeah, if if the trainer that you have registered on your e-portfolio your, isn't maybe the correct one, you're not working with them so much, and you are working with another registered trainer, we can absolutely update that information for you. There's no problem. Just, just let them yeah. know. It's just to make sure that when you do your end of post meeting, it has to be with the person who you're, you're assigned, is your assigned trainer, though. So before you sit down for that meeting, contact us to get it changed if you need it changed. But for a lot of the, the workplace assessments, um, another trainer can fill them in. And whoever your assigned trainer is gets a notification to just accept that. So next question. My consultant trainer is on maternity leave and she has a locum cover. Will the locum consultant act as my consultant trainer? Example for discussion with ePortfolio and sign off. So um, generally as a rule, locums wouldn't be registered as an RCPI trainer. So you wouldn't be able to complete any of your um, e-portfolio forms with them. You could, however, if there's a training lead in your site, you could link in with them. Um, and so you could have the discussions and everything with the locum. But as long as the training lead were to sign off the forms um, and were to you know, oversee the training, in essence, that would be fine. Just let us yeah. know. Yes, I think when you log in, when, when again, when you get that email saying that this is your, you know, your, your, your portfolio, if the person who's appearing there isn't going to be someone who's able to, to do anything, then let us know. We may already have corrected that because your regional program director might already have let us know that, that someone's on maternity leave or something like that. Is my speaker working here again? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> John, go ahead. Apologies for the background. My daughter was obviously using this last... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used it in a while <laughs> just yet. So that doesn't happen in, well, it happens, it can happen frequently and the regional program directors are used to dealing with it. So they're happy enough to step in and to, to carry out all the paperwork and do the assessments and the reviews. But it's important that they know early on in the rotation so they can be kept abreast as to how you're progressing in your, in your training in that circumstance. Um, so if there's, if there's a locum, the locum can do the training. They can give you the teaching and, um, Make sure that the team is functioning as a training team. They just mightn't be able to do the, the bureaucratic part of it in the logbook. But then the local training lead in the peripheral hospitals or the regional program director in the hub would be able to do that part of it for you. Okay, so next question. Um, hi guys, thanks for the webinar. Can we get educational leave for non-MRCPI related study? Example, masters. I think I, I'm not sure the exact rule on that, but I suppose from a HR point of view in the HSE, all, all study leave is at the discretion of the employer. Um, so, I mean, you can ask for it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be granted, would be my understanding. Have you any, any uh, other ideas on that one, folks? Um, I mean, I, I guess... It would depend, really, I suppose, on how much leave was, how much leave you were planning on taking, in essence, as well. I mean, the, the BST has certain requirements that, you know, depending on the amount of time that you do take off, that would need to be made up at the end. Um, I mean, that would be in the case of special leave. So I guess it would really come down to, to the RPDs, um, you know, whether, whether they would be happy to approve the leave and then um, maybe get overall approval. Okay, so next question. When will the mandatory courses be up and running again? And will they be occurring in person or over Zoom? Um, so yes, they are running. Um, we are running them over Zoom. Um, and we will be sending out the pre-assigned dates to you guys um, in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Next question, if we have, if we need to take some time off during the BST, sick leave, maternity leave, will we have to complete the missed rotation at the end or will other rotations be assigned depending on availability? So I can take this one, yeah. So you're, throughout your BST, the, the, at the end, the total amount of special leave would be sort of accumulated 
and that would then determine how many rotations you would need to to sort of make up at the end. Um, I suppose it is worth bearing in mind that obviously your core requirements would need to be taken into consideration as well. And within your specific site, if you're returning and they don't have a, a place available for you, you may need to wait until the place becomes available. So um, that's just something to be to be mindful of. Generally, that wouldn't it doesn't happen very often, but it is just something I suppose to be mindful um, of. Yeah, okay. So next question. Are we meant to get the leave card upon starting our rotation in the current hospital? So you would have received an email from our CPI um, about the student leave cards. Um, you have from this week until the 12th of August to apply for your student leave card. So um, if you didn't get that email, you can send us an email and we'll get that information to you. Next question, if I don't have any portfolio link on my digital hub yet, will it be coming in the next few days? Yes, so it isn't available yet. Um, we're working on getting that sorted for all of you in the coming days, okay? How can I increase my chances of getting accepted into a HST seat right after BST? That's probably one for me. Um... So the, the HSE and NDTP are, are hoping that um, more and more people will progress directly through their training, go straight from intern, SHO, SHO2, and straight into HST. So we're hoping it will become the, the norm, and it's something that everybody should, should aim for. Obviously, you have to have your BST cert, so you will have to have completed your exams. Um, it does tend to look a little bit bit better on your CV if you've completed the exams first time, but that's not a prerequisite. And the other things that you're marked on at HST interview would be exposure to the to the specialty. So for instance, if you have an idea now that you want to do gastroenterology, say, and then you know you have a rotation in gastroenterology, very important at your initial meeting with your trainer in gastroenterology that you say that that's your career ambition. You know, you say then, OK, I would like to get experience in endoscopy. Can I go up to the endoscopy suite? And I mean, traditionally, SHOs wouldn't go up to the endoscopy suite and trainers might think they have no interest at all. But if you express that interest, you'll be facilitated almost certainly. And then that's a line in your CV that you've assisted or witnessed endoscopies and similar for, for other specialties. And then the other thing that would be marked on would be research. Now, I always say that your your priority is to, to get your exams in the two years and to fulfill all your other curricular activities. So you shouldn't let um, the pursuit of, of research interfere with that. But if there's a research project going on in the specialty that you're interested in, and you can become involved in that in some small way without interfering with your studies, fantastic. That's another line on your CV. And a research project doesn't necessarily have to be in the specialty that you're interested in. Um, so I suppose if you know your specialty, then start building your CV in that respect before you, you apply for HST. Okay, so next question. I've been, I've already been told by my department that I will likely have minimal interaction with the consultants. They are unapproachable, only around once a week for one hour. Any tips on how to approach this situation tactfully? I expect that's my one. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a difficult one. Um, I mean, I don't like to hear that, but I won't pretend that there are not some posts that are not perfect, shall we say. Um, so we have lots of people trying to tackle with this under the, I suppose, under the heading of trainer engagement. And I suppose the two or the three people that should be able to help deal with this for you would be the, the local training lead, the regional program director and myself. So, I mean, I would be happy to tactfully take an email from you. And um, obviously it has to be done tactfully because this is all potentially rumor and innuendo. But if I, if I get an email, anonym, well, it will not be anonymous. It'll have to be come from one of you, but I won't be telling anybody the names. I can approach the regional program director who supervises that scheme and that particular post and just explore is that actually the case 
and um, they might well know that there's an issue with a particular post or it might be the first they heard of it and I can ask them to, to investigate that a little. And I suppose I wouldn't let the fact that these consultants are deemed unapproachable uh, don't use that as an excuse to not do what Ashley was saying earlier. You should be very clear that you need to meet this consultant to go through your um, training plan and all that for the three months. I would I would use that rumor as a motivation to be like a dog with a bone about getting to sit down with the trainer. And if you know if you can't get to sit down with the trainer, knowing that rumor you've heard, then let the college know. I mean, rarely we have had to remove training credit from particular posts. And as I was saying earlier, having a BST trainee is somewhat of a, of a privilege. And trainers are very, very keen to have BST trainees working with them. So, you know, most trainers, if they are aware that there is that their post has negative press or that they're not carrying out their training to the highest standards and it's, it's known about, will step up to the plate, I would hope. But just practically speaking, if you want to email me what job that, that, that is, and I can, I can explore it. Can I just add, add one of the other piece on there? Because I do think it's really important to not be afraid to speak up if there's, if there's any problem. But there is an anonymous trainee survey that goes out throughout the year where you have the option to give feedback on your post totally anonymously. And that's really helpful for us because we see then if there's more than one person coming through that, that, that does have it. So you'll hear people talking about the, it's called TPE now, is it? Training Post Evaluation Survey. Um, and you'll, you'll probably get emails on it. So it's worth taking some time um, to fill that out because people don't always feel comfortable emailing in specifically. But do you think anyone who's ever done that because they've had a problem with their trainer has had a really positive outcome from working with their program director and with, uh, with John on that? So I think it's, it's a really important thing to do. I just should add as well, I did mention in my talk about giving details of things. So did, are you going to give out my email address, folks, later? We gave the BST email address um, for, for directing towards you. It's what we put up at the moment. Yeah, that's fine. But I, I mean, John McDermott at rcsi.ie as well, if anyone wants to email me directly. And then we, I had said as well, we'd, we'd supply everyone with the email of the local training lead and the regional program director as well. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, for those that came back to work in a medical specialty over the last three months, is it possible to have this accredited for the BST under any circumstances? I can take this one. So generally, um, I mean, as, as a rule, any time not on a scheme, we wouldn't be able to give credit for, unfortunately. Um, you know, the, the training would need to have been completed as part of, this, of an official scheme with the trainer and, and recording of progress and stuff, so unfortunately not. Okay, next question. Can we do all few prescribing assessments within one rotation? No, they're across two years. You have to do two each year. And the reason for that is is that, you know, you're, you want to make sure that your skills are staying there and that they're, they're, they're updating. And the standard that you're marked against will be the standard for an SHO in year one versus the standard for an SHO in year two. So some of your requirements you can do all at once and you can get them all done in your first rotation if you want. With some of the others, there's a, a, a time limit on them. So prescribing is one where there's two in first year and two in second year. And they're supposed to be with different people as well. In regards to procedures and case studies, are they to be assigned? Are they to be assigned only by consultants, or can registrars supervising sign off on behalf? Example: Admitting patients on call is likely with post a consultant and not necessarily my trainer. Also, procedures: Lumbar puncture. A registrar likely would be supervising than a consultant. Um, so there's two two different things there. So your acute pieces, we know you're not really going to be filling them in with someone present. So you'll be filling in your acute medicine experience yourself. And then your trainer will be saying, is the record that you filled in about yourself accurate? That's what they'll be saying when you when you meet them. But you should absolutely ask whoever's with you for, for feedback on that kind of thing. Um, for procedures, there are some where you have to have a directly observed assessment with the trainer. But for a lot of them, it's just where someone has to fill in um, the just, just fill in their name. So they don't have to be an assigned trainer. So things like physical exam, it can be your SBR, 
who's the name that, that you fill in. But I think, you know, your trainers are there to, to help you. They should be also working with you and they shouldn't be devolving everything to an SQ or to do it. But there's some scope within that. So if you see in the ePortfolio, if it asks for name and role, that means it can be anyone who fills it in. And if it doesn't ask for name and role and it has a section at the end that says trainer sign up, um, then that's, that's what you're looking for there. Yeah, next question. I passed my MRCPI written part two in 2018 and couldn't get a, a place for clinical in early 2020 for clinical as BST were preferred. I was non-trainee, then COVID happened. Is there any extension period being planned for us for clinical as part two written expires if clinical is not passed within certain period? So we're extending the dates if people haven't been able to, to say people who should have done it in June because they would have been outside of the two years in June. We will be letting people pass it to, to um, come on to it later on. Um, but it's just emailing in and, and registering. And obviously when you're on, on BST, it's, it's different there. Um, part of that as well will be, if, you know, if you've attempted it in between and things like that, it's already case by case. So uh, we're going to do a, a follow-up webinar where we'll have uh, an administrator from the exams department who can answer some really specific questions on things like that. We're just going to hold off a couple of weeks before we do that so we know what's happening with the clinicals. Um, so it'll likely be kind of in maybe three or four weeks' time when we do that and we'll have some more complete answers. And I'll go through a breakdown of the exam blueprint and things like that during that call. I understand there are mandatory courses which we could have to which we would have to complete during BSD years, example leadership. Would CPD points be applicable to us? Example signing in for ground round ground rounds. No, the C CPD points would be just for um, consultants, really, in the, the professional competence scheme. I mean, the, the grant obviously you should be going to ground rounds as part of your BST training, but you don't take CPD points for it. You just complete your e-portfolio. Any specific advice for endocrine HST application? That's definitely for me. <laughs> uh, no, just the same advice really for other other specialties. If you're interested in endocrinology, say it to your consultant at your at your first meeting. Um, hopefully, if you're interested in endocrinology, you'll be doing an endocrinology rotation. That will really stand to you. Um, there's potentially, I mean, the, the RPDs don't like this but there's the potential to swap rotations so say in your two years you don't have uh, an endocrine rotation and you find someone you've got a gastro rotation and you find someone who wants to do gastro and you can come up with a very convenient swap that won't affect anyone else and you go to your regional program director and present that to them they may well approve a swap um, but otherwise as i said if you can get some research done in endocrinology if you're in you know, another specialty that might have, uh, say you were in gastroenterology and you asked to see patients with fatty liver, you might um, translate that into your future endocrine practice. Um, so I suppose just, just think about it all the time. And when you're meeting your trainer at the beginning of each rotation, just say that you have an interest in endocrinology and what can you do to further your career in that, in that regard. And can I just add one more piece to that? So a lot of people on the call, you'll have gotten a survey link from us asking you some questions about what to, um, what you wanted covered. So based on the feedback from that, one of the things we're hoping to have in September, October is um, just some pieces around specific to different specialties, kind of what you should be thinking about during BST. Um, so we're hoping that we'll be able to get a good, a good few representatives from different specialties to, to cover that and we'll um, update you on it. Um, hopefully in the near future, depending on when we know we're going to be able to go back into the office and things like that. Just going back to the, the budding endocrinologist, if you want to email me, tell me what scheme you're on, I could then touch base with, um, with the endocrinologists in your, in your hospital. Um, are we able to access most current information on how many spots were allocated for HSD for individual specialties? Uh, there's a pub, there, there is published on the website um, for the, the medical council. I can't think off the top of my head what the report back is called, um, but there is a piece on, on our website which is for public 
disclosure basically around uh, how many people are accepted to the different schemes. Probably would only have updated for the last year's intake. We wouldn't have updated it for this year's intake. Just yeah, yeah. Yet. yeah. If you just want to get a sense of it, though, they'll be roughly the same for most of them. How shall we pursue research opportunities in our current hospital network? So, um, as I was saying earlier, you, it's fantastic if you can get some research done, but don't think that you have to do it and don't let it distract you from getting your exams and fulfilling all your other curriculum requirements. But again, if you actually had an idea about a research project you were interested in, fantastic, approach your consultant trainer. Or if it's in a particular specialty and you're not with that, in that specialty at the moment, by all means, approach your training lead or a consultant in the hospital who's working in that specialty. But if you just want to get involved in something that's going on, you don't have any particular ideas yourself, again, just say it at your first meeting that you're really interested in getting some research done. Are there any projects going on in the department or in the hospital at the moment that you can get involved in? And most departments will have, will have something. And if they don't have something going on at the moment, just the fact that they've found someone who's actually keen to do some work, they'll be delighted and they'll find some things. And I mean, we talk maybe talking about research, but audits, there are always audits that can be done in the department. And that's another line to your CV and potentially could result in a, in a publication. A lot of hospitals have their own local um, research meetings and the bar for getting something published as a poster at those meetings would be lower than at national or international meetings. But again, it's still a line on your CV that you've published at X meeting. And it proves to people at interview that you're able to um, start a project and complete it and write it up and present it. Is it possible to apply for study leave for research purposes, particularly if it's a very time consuming project? Uh, I think that would be pushing it a little. Um, I mean, the, the again, I'd have to look it up, but I think is is it two weeks of study leave that SHOs are entitled to? Yeah, I'm not sure what the what the actual requirements for study leave are. I think it's two weeks, and it's at the employer's discretion. I mean, if you're someone who has maybe you've done your exams already before entering BST, and you're not going to get study leave for anything else, you know, if you're on a team that's maybe quiet or very well staffed and they can spare you, they might give you a week or two for something like that. Um, I wish I could get it myself for that. Um, there's no harm in asking, but I've never, I've never seen it given, but there's no harm in asking. Any future plans to set up online MRCPI study materials for examination prep? Everyone at the moment uses the MRCP UK question banks. Um, so we don't, we have some practice questions. There's about uh, 80 to 100 on a free course that you can do that's on the website, which is really just geared towards giving you the structure of it. And um, the one thing we would always say about our cases is the people who submit questions for our exams are trainers who are writing up based on cases that they're working on with their SHOs and hospitals. So that is, you know, your best way in terms of preparing for the. Uh, written exams. The part two is very case-based. The part one has some more kind of knowledge on guidelines and things like that. Um, so obviously kind of reading up and studying from that point of view is useful there. There's not currently plans to develop a RCPI question bank. Um, as I said earlier, the, I think the best use of BMJ is for things like testing yourself and seeing what your kind of strengths and weaknesses are in certain, um, certain questions and in certain areas. Several of us have bought subscriptions to BMJ Question Bank for MRCP Part 2 in recent weeks, planning to sit in September. Would it be possible to claim back this or have it sub subsidized, given there is a free subscri subscription available through the RCPI? I can take this one. So we, we wouldn't be able to... Uh, do refunds or subsidies or anything for like that? Unfortunately, the the BMJ codes that you get, you you can get one per training year, and that'll give you four months access. Um, but unfortunately, if you've already purchased one, there's we wouldn't be able to to go back in hindsight with that or anything. Unfortunately, as a non EU citizen, 
Do I have equal opportunities when considered for HST on applying, leaving apart other factors on CV? So the, the way that that works is you are um, you're interviewed, your application is treated in the same way as everybody else's. You're interviewed in exactly the same way as everybody else, and you're panelled as per your interview performance. But uh, EU law states that you can't get a job ahead of an equally qualified EU citizen, which is very unfair, um, but that's the law, unfortunately. So if, um, just trying to think at a recent interview, if you happen to come second in the interview and there were there were six people panelled and there were only five jobs and the other f six people, there were five jobs, the other five people were all EU, those five people would get the job even though you came second at interview. Um, but if there are enough jobs and you get appointed, you're treated the same as the same as everybody else. Does that sum it up, guys? Yep. Yeah. To increase exposure in a chosen specialty for HSD application purposes, are we covered to work in a clinic in a different hospital if a consultant is happy to have you on the team for a week on annual or educational leave, for example, working in St. James's on the BST and volunteer in Tala Clinic for a week or vice versa? Yeah, that's, that's completely doable. And I mean, particularly wouldn't be an issue at all with James and Tala. I mean, they're part of the same hospital group. And they're part of the same. We've definitely had trainees do that before. Yeah, they're part of the same BST hub, actually. It's, a, it's James's Tala hub. Can we swap a rotation with another person within our hub, but not within our hospital? For example, James's and Tala swap. I can take this one. Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Jane. <laughs> um, again, yeah, but, I mean they're in the they're in the same hub, so that's that's fine. You would uh, need to clear it. So um, with James's and Tala, so uh, Professor Declan Byrne is the RPD in James's, and Dr. Lucian Behan is the RPD in Tala. So you'd need to get approval from both RPDs. Um, and as long as your core requirements aren't affected um, or any of your curricular requirements um, and the both RPDs approve it, then it would be fine. Yeah, and as I was saying earlier, the RPDs, um, they hate this happening because it's an awful lot of hassle. And more often than not, when they actually look at the proposed swap in detail, it's going to mess something up. It's going to mess up one person's curriculum requirements or the other person's or there's going to be some problem with it. So if you want to do it, just make sure you've got all your ducks in a row. You talk with the other trainee about it. You make sure both of you are still going to meet all your curriculum requirements. You're both going to still do all your core specialties. You're both going to um, have done all your on call and present the RPD with it as a package that's all signed off and ready to go. And it's much more likely to be approved in that circumstance. If you are interested in a specific rotation and it happens to be one of your last half jobs, would this affect HSD applications as the application would be sent prior to this experience? If so, is swapping the timing of a rotation possible? Thanks. You, you can certainly try to swap the timing of a rotation. Um, it's, it's, as I've said, it's, it's quite difficult to do and still meet all your curriculum requirements and finding another trainee who's happy to make the swap. Um, I mean, if you're, you have your mind set on a particular specialty and you're due to work in that specialty after the application, I would approach the, the consultant in that specialty early on. And, you know, they probably be happy to support you in attending their clinics or getting involved in the specialty even before you're, you're due to work with them. Um, and then, I mean, if you do that, then that consultant will know you and will know that you work well, hopefully, and uh, will be able to advocate for you then at, at interview. Um, and then I suppose they, your CV will state for the panelists that you're going to be working in the specialty. So they know that when you get onto HST, you will have done three months in the specialty. But so in summary, you can try to swap, but it's difficult. 
if you can't swap, it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. You can still find a way to get exposure to the specialty and to get to get known by the consultants. In regards to BSC teaching, are they held locally? Also, is there a set number of attendance which is expected and would the teaching be up and running imminently? So different hubs will run their teaching differently. Some people will be doing regular tutorials as they go through. Some of them will do them in blocks. Um, so the require you are have some requirements to attend teaching, but basically it's if your regional program director says there's teaching on, you should attend the majority of that teaching, and they will ask you about it when you uh, when you're in your end of post assessment and things like that. If you didn't attend the the teaching that was made available to you. Um, and there are some specific videos online that we do um, ask you to, to watch. In regards to BST teaching, oh, sorry, that was the same question. <laughs> and as RCPI students, do we gain access to any evidence-based medicine resources? Yeah, so you have online to the, your, the online resources in the digital hub, you can access journals and there's some research material there. And um, you also have the four month BMJ online examination pass. And I think, Guy, any? Yeah, I mean, mo most of the things that are in that um, resource there are because they're things that um, aren't free in hospitals. So we do try to provide the subscription we're trying not to duplicate what's there. So it's, it's really, if there's something specific that you are looking for and you don't um, have access to, you can always ask, but um, it's, it's only really if a, a lot of people want the same resource that we look down, uh, down the road of, of uh, purchasing it. I understand that it requires a fellow SHO to swap and the supervisor to agree to the swap, but surely doing six months in this specific specialty increases your chances at HSD applications? You won't get your BST requirements covered if you did six months in one specialty. I mean, it is, it, as, as I was saying, it is a benefit, all right, in HSD application if you have had exposure to the specialty, certainly. And um, six months, as Ashling said, is probably too much. We, um, who we're training, we want you to be well-rounded. We don't want someone to be pure endocrinology. Endocrinology is a big general medicine component, as do the other specialties. So you can sometimes be too focused on a particular specialty at too early a stage. Um, at your stage, you want to be, again, unless you're someone who's done lots of SHO jobs elsewhere before, but you want to be getting very broad knowledge of, of every specialty that you rotate through. Um, but yes, having had the exposure and especially helps you at HST. So if you're not doing that particular, especially it is nice to swap if you can. Um, but remember, I suppose your assignment to particular rotations is a competitive process and not everybody can do the exact rotations that they, that they want to do. How is Brexit affecting British BST trainees? Um, I could take this one. So I guess the... Previous recruitment um, occurred effectively before kind of Brexit happened or the final date of Brexit in January. Um, for the incoming, the next year intake for next year, we haven't actually looked at the recruitment side of things for next year. So at the moment, I guess we don't have any solid answers on that. We'll just have to um, wait and see and whatever the laws are in place at that time, obviously we will have to follow them, but that it hasn't been determined just as of yet. Do you have to change your medical council registration from general to specialist training division? Yes, you need to be on the trainee specialist division to be on a training program. Yeah. Can we locum whilst on BST contract? So your training agreement um, would, would clarify this, but um, no, it would be the short answer. Um, I'm in, I'm, if I'm on ED rotation, can I leave for medical teaching tutorials, ground rounds in my hospital? 
not only can you, but you you should. Um, it is a problem with some um, ED posts that I suppose they're not maybe in tune with when the medical teaching is happening. Um, but you are supposed to be released for it. And again, if it's just not happening, you need to approach your trainer. If you're not getting satisfaction, approach your training lead. I mean, I've spoken to training leads over the years in hospitals where they realize that it's not happening and they've removed trainees from ED rotations. So make sure it happens. Okay. Um, is there any formal protocol in place if a global pandemic, i.e. COVID, disrupts our training? I mean, what we had to do this year was was just look at what the, the impact was. We went back to the trainers in the different sites and asked, had people still been able to complete some of the, the requirements? Had people still been able to, um, you know, get the exposure that they were supposed to? It does kind of depend on the, the duration of it. And we were kind of looking at how it links compared to, say, if someone went on X amount of sick leave or, or anything like that. Um, so it really all has to be, be case by case. But obviously, the main priority will be to make sure that no one's disadvantaged um, out of the, the circumstances that they find themselves in. And there are allowances being made at the end of this year for people who are, who are moving forward who maybe haven't met um, some of the requirements for whatever reason. And it's expected it'll be reasonable for them to get it within X amount of time. But we can really only take those kind of things on a case by case basis. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Um, and if we didn't answer your question during the Q&A, um, you can email us your question and we can answer it then. Um, and the recording will be available um, as well later on. Um, so the last question is, training programs in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and North America along with most other developed countries, have online learning materials for the specific examinations set by the colleges in each country. Why isn't there any future plans for Ireland to provide its MRCPI trainees with the necess necessary online training materials for their own specific examinations? So your exam is a professional examination based around your clinical experience. It's not about, you know, it's, it's supposed to be about actually going out, seeing patients, treating them, learning the things that you see in the hospital. It's blueprinted towards, um, towards your clinical experience and looking at the exposure people are going to get at different levels within BST um, also dictates what goes into which part of the exam. Um, it's not intended to be an end of course examination where we put up some pieces online. We do want to put things in place that will help people to organise their study to um, you know, feel that they have enough information about the exam um, to, to approach it. But um, that's basically why. And most of those question banks from other places, they're just buying content off each other. And when we bought content in from the UK in the past, um, we found that it hasn't ended up really being reflective of the actual exam you're sitting. Um, so otherwise it means getting, getting consultants to write the, the questions, which at the end of the day, aren't actually super useful to people in passing the exam. They're more just a reassurance for people. That's the, the kind of nutshell approach of it, but we, we have kind of scoped that out quite widely as to what the pros and cons of, of developing it would be. Um, just one thing I wanted to, just to clarify. So as part of the your training, the curriculum obviously has certain requirements that you need to meet. And so, um, one of the points, one of the questions we, we saw coming through was you can do six months in one specialty during your two years on BST, but that's the maximum. You wouldn't be able to do any more than six months in any one specialty. Um, so just, just to clarify that. Yeah, sorry, that was my fault for saying, saying that in response to the other question. But it's just, yeah, that, that you know, kind of looking to change out of a rotation um, just to get the six months experience for HST application is probably not going to help you in the long run there. And it does, I mean, your point was correct. I think it does make it harder to achieve your... your yeah, so something like medicine for the elderly is a very broad um, specialty. So you're going to get a lot of experience. You're probably going to get some of your cardiology cases and your respiratory cases in a medicine for the elderly rotation, whereas someone who's in, in looking for, a, say, an endocrine um, rotation, two, two of them, like six months, might not. You know, so it's just different things like that, depending on them. 
I suppose in pra- sorry, may in yeah. practice in practice people who end up doing six months and especially they might do three months of gastroenterology in their hub and then they might do three months in a peripheral rotation in the gastroenterology service. But the gastroenterology service in the peripheral hub is a different beast. You're doing a lot of you're going to be doing a lot of general medicine and maybe not as much specialized gastroenterology. Yeah. And the, the RPDs do put, I think, a good bit of thought into into what's going to make sense as a complete rotation for everyone. So that's where, you know, swapping around is, is problematic because it'll impact other people as well. So that's all the time we have. Thank you all very much for joining. And we hope this was, you know, very helpful to you. And we wish you all the best. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us. So I'm going to. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.